Yes, I won't talk about the situation inside Russia. I'm very interested to hear what Yevgenia and others have to say about that. But I think it's interesting to think about how the struggle for world opinion is going. And I have to say, I, was very, I had an interesting conversation with a senior European diplomat earlier this week who said that in arguments about sanctions, in arguments about how to treat Russia, he's finding it much harder going than he expected in convincing the big non-European powers, the, the, the Brazils, the South Africas, Indonesias, etc., that the West is on the right side of the argument and that they should join us in being tough on Russia and tough on Putin. And now why is that? It would be um, kind of easy to say, oh, well, it's because the Russians are mounting this fantastic propaganda effort and everybody's had their minds brainwashed by Russia today. But I think it's a, that's not true. It's a lot more complicated than that, than that. I think that partly we're seeing the consequences of Western policies that were adopted over the last 15 years now being almost kind of mirrored by the Russians. I, I, and so that they use arguments that we have made in... in uh, over Iraq and over Kosovo and turn them back on us. Now, I don't think that the way they use those arguments are at all intellectually respectable or legitimate, but they are, in the court of world opinion, surprisingly effective. So, on the question of secession, you know, is this allowed? They'll say, well, look, you supported Kosovo. What's so different about Crimea? On the question of are you allowed to intervene? They will dress up their intervention in eastern Ukraine as humanitarian intervention and say, well, look, you guys have intervened on humanitarian grounds all over the world. Uh, and on the question of well, whether it's legitimate to, to fight outside your borders, which, of course, they deny they're doing, but they'll say, well, look, you, the West intervened in Iraq. At least this is kind of next door to us. And... There are very good answers to all of those parallels, why those parallels don't work, but you've got to understand that outside the West, those arguments do resonate with the Brazilians, the, you know, even democratic countries, Brazil, India, etc., give some credence to those arguments. And it means that the West does not have it all one way when we're trying to argue for our policy on Russia. And I think it's partly because the arguments the Russians deploy have some resonance, and it's partly because these other countries, even if they don't particularly approve of the Putin regime or what the Russians are doing, do like the idea of a multipolar world. They weren't comfortable with a world in which the United States was absolutely the dominant power. And they see something valuable in keeping a powerful Russia. Uh, I you know, think that they're making a, a big mistake, but that is a line of thinking out there, which I think the Russians quite successfully exploit. Uh, so that's the non-Western world. Just a couple of thoughts on what's happening inside Europe. Again, I think there's more resonance for Russia and the arguments that Russia's making than one would necessarily feel comfortable with. Um, I think in Britain, you know, where, where I come from, it's, there's a fairly uni unanimous um, agreement that Russia's not, uh, there's not much sympathy for Russia's position, but there are a couple of important uh, caveats to that. The leaders of the two nationalist parties in Britain, the Scottish nationalist, Alex Salmond, and the United Kingdom Independence Party, Nigel Farage, both in, in interviews, before, admittedly before the Ukraine uh, intervention, when asked which world politicians they most admired, both mentioned Vladimir Putin, amazingly enough. And I think it's a question of nationalists recognizing nationalists. And, and also, they, uh, so uh, that, that tells you something. That the idea of a strong Russia and a proud Russia is something that has some resonance amongst nationalist politicians, and much more so in France, where Marine Le Pen is positioning herself as a friend of Russia, a friend of Putin, and is now at 45% you know, in the polls in France. And a French colleague of mine said to me, you know, uh, that the pro-Russia faction in 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 France is the far left, the far right, and then he said, oh, and the center right. That doesn't leave much, actually. Um, so, although it would, we would like to think that the arguments about the wrongness of what Russia's done are self-evident, actually, there is much more of a global debate about it than you might realize sitting here in Kiev or might be comfortable with. Okay, thank you very much, Gideon.
Um, now we will hear from uh, Yevgenia Albat. She's the editor-in-chief of the New Times, uh, and perhaps offer us a little bit of a Russian perspective. Please. Which language are we going to speak? Как вы хотите. English, по-русски, по-украински. Я не говорю по-украински. Я, во-первых, хочу поблагодарить... I don't speak uh, Ukrainian. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, for the invitation. It's uh, very important nowadays in the present uh, situation uh, for intellectuals of different parts of the world to get together and to try to understand what is going on. Dangerous period in the history of Europe. Probably uh, many of us who have started to read the books uh, on, you know, the rise of Nazi Germany and on the development of the Nazi regime in uh, Germany in 1930s. Um, I think that the most important thing in understanding uh, or in, in our attempt to understand what happened is uh, not to go into judging uh, Vladimir Putin as an insane. I think it's, uh, it's important to understand that he's quite rational, uh, regardless that he can get emotional, but in his steps he's very rational, that the decisions that have been made uh, with respect to Crimea and then Ukraine, the, uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, uh, they were only to a certain extent um, sporadic and emotional. I think that uh, Putin was long uh, ready uh, to uh, go into action that will pronounce uh, his regime and Russia as the only challenge uh, to the United States. I think it's important to understand that his rationale lies in, the, uh, in, his, uh, in, in his view of the world as, uh, uh, as a, uh, a bipolar world where you know, the zero-sum game is at place, uh, that he uh, thinks that Russia is capable to challenge the United States, and that's all he cares about, only if it's become, in a way, uh, as big and as powerful as the USSR was. And uh, I think that's the, what drives him the most. However, of course, the most uh, difficult question for us in uh, Russia is uh, the change in the public opinion and these unanimous support that we see uh, to um, Vladimir Putin and his decisions uh, with respect to uh, Crimea and the whole situation, the whole war with Ukraine. Um, again, uh, just you know, when I was on the flight to Kiev, I was reading a paper that just came out. It's the paper written by Ekaterina Zhuravska, the famous political economist. She's now with the uh, Paris School of Economics before she was with New, uh, New Economic School of Moscow and with, with her colleagues. She has started uh, and did a very good uh, statistical analysis of the effect of radio propaganda in Nazi Germany. It's just, you know, it's, it's about uh, to get published. What's interesting that uh, 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 that in the current Russia, we, uh, we see that our um, belief in social networks and internet and etc., that basically uh, neither internet nor social networks can do anything uh, against the, uh, the, such a powerful mass, mass media as, uh, uh, as TV. Uh, in, uh, according to current stats, 65% of Russians, they read internet, they internet users, and etc. However, uh, 
we see that the public opinion was quickly changed by very efficient, uh, uh, by very efficient propaganda that comes out of the media, uh, of all the TV uh, channels existed in Russia. And obviously, and almost nothing existed uh, uh, in this sphere which carries some sort of independent uh, analysis of the current situation. Echo Moskvi, the, the Moscow-based broadcasting with the audience of about uh, one to two billion people, uh, predominantly in big cities, that's now uh, uh, the biggest electronic media capable somehow to deliver other news than the ones that come out of uh, uh, TVs. Uh, the methods that are used by the TV propaganda uh, comes out of the ads business, and that's the repetition after repetition. You know, you know this famous joke that if, each, uh, uh, if you're driving the car and uh, every other mile you see a billboard saying drink Coca-Cola, then in uh, 50 miles, regardless whether you want Coca-Cola or, Coca or you don't want Coca-Cola, you are going to drink Coca-Cola. That's precisely the way this Russian propaganda works. And we see that all these techniques that are known in political science as feeding frenzy, uh, they were developed ahead of the situation, ahead of the current situation, and uh, they're very, quite effectively, they are um, used in the current uh, situation. However, it's interesting that um, Kremlin itself has gotten a little bit frightened by the hysteria this, uh, that is going on um, among the Russian public, this um, extremely militarized uh, way of thinking that we see in the Russian public now. So in the last uh, uh, a couple of weeks, I would say 10 days, the rhetoric, you know, this uh, war rhetoric that was pouring out of, the, of all the TV channels and networks in Russia, it goes a little bit down. So we see that, that suggests that uh, uh, there is no final decision made uh, with respect to uh, what Putin to, is going to do next. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about what's going to happen. However, I think that there is still, judging by the uh, propaganda machine, uh, we see that, uh, that there is, you know, there is, at least there is some dispute, some discussion keeps going on uh, among the, uh, inside the Kremlin and circles surrounding Kremlin. I think that it's important for us to understand that we, we overestimated the power of Internet. In fact, you know, should I, should I be writing uh, another book now, I would title it The Rise and Fall of Internet. Uh, we see now that that's the medium that is very easy to manipulate, that is under the control of different secret services, regardless whether we're talking about uh, uh, U.S. National Security Agency or uh, Soviet-style Russian uh, KGB. Obviously, it's very easy to control Internet, and I believe that, uh, you know, I'm trying to return back to the theme that was announced on the program, that in uh, the next couple of years we will see how, you know, how uh, uh, world media will be returning back to the more or less old ways of presenting news. We now understand that journalism web uh, 2.0 doesn't exist, that there is no, there is, it's a, that, you know, it's a, it's a job, it's a profession, and uh, it's very dangerous uh, to uh, leave, you know, the, the 
business of news or to give the business of news in the hands of amateur people who are very easy to get manipulated by uh, professional secret services. So, uh, I really, Christina, I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, finish my presentation because obviously we're moving from the, the topic of uh, our panel. Uh, uh, I, would, I would just say that uh, I understand that for me as a Russian citizen, and I'm the Russian citizen, I don't have any other citizenship. Uh, it's quite hard to speak in Kyiv because I feel extremely guilty of what my government did with respect to uh, Ukraine and its people, and I feel your pain. <laughs> my reporters are working, they were, my re reporters of my magazine, they, uh, they were here on Maidan and they're working now out of Donetsk and Slavyansk and Mariupol and from the border of Russia and Ukraine. We're trying to uh, present uh, our audience with unbiased uh, reporting and analysis. Um, however, it's obviously, uh, as each and every citizen of the Russian Federation, and especially of my age, I bear responsibility for what was done by my government and what, uh, for what is, go is going to be done by my government. And I'm very, very sorry. Thank you. Well, thank you, Evgenia, especially for those last remarks. Uh, that's hard to say, and I think it's really, really important to hear it said. And it's very important and difficult work that you're doing now. So, спасибо огромное. Uh, now we'll hear from President Ilves, and I would be especially interested in your reaction to what Gideon has said to us, which is that the Russian position, the notion of Russia presenting an alternative, a healthy alternative to the West, Gideon has found has had a lot of resonance even in non-Western democracies. Well, thank you. I'll try to get to that. I may be a little uh, inchoate here because it's a very broad topic. Let me say that I, I, I think that um, while many people made fun of uh, Francis Fukuyama's 1989 essay that he, the end of history uh, by pointing to various conflicts saying that, well, see, history is still going on. Uh, I think it, it has taken 25 years actually to now to actually say that the, that the intellectual battle, which was his argument, the intellectual battle in favor of liberal democracy had been won, has been now challenged seriously. And what I see is um, a genuine and seriously mounted attack on the fundamentals of liberal democracy that, um, aside from all, breaking all the agreements that I mentioned in my earlier speech, but this is, I mean, it's as if uh, in many ways that, um, that the first descriptive ripost to Fukuyama was, was the clash of civilizations. And it seems that Samuel Huntington's description of the world has been taken now as a proscription of how to do things. And there we see a massive civilizational argument being mounted against liberal democracy, including freedom of speech, freedom of the press, tolerance, uh, rule of law, that there is that the presentation of Russia as an alternative civilization to the decadent homosexual freely speaking democracies is now in full swing and well funded. Um, and one of the things that is actually coming under attack, and this is, I would recommend to everybody interested in this, is the absolutely brilliant short piece in this week's Atlantic by Peter Pomarantsev on the disinformation 
that is being spread. I think he's really the first person to hit it right on the mark, saying basically it is the creation of an alternative reality where objective truth does not count. And this really no longer strikes at sort of the development of liberal democracy in the 20th and 21st century, but actually at the Scottish empiricists. I mean, seeing is believing, which is the same one way of putting it, but basically the, it is the creation of an alternative reality that has nothing to do with the Scottish empiricists saying we're looking at what's going on. We're not, there are no received truths. And now, in fact, we have received truths being produced and fabricated and objectivity, the objective truth no longer exists. And uh, Pomerantsev actually brings a number of Russian journalists who say precisely that. It doesn't matter what is objective truth, what matters is what people see and think. Uh, and now, on my argument that we see the first challenge, the real genuine challenge to liberal democracy being mounted, uh, and proceeding from uh, Evgenia's comments about fascism and Nazism, that there was the smartest uh, Nazi, uh, the, the only real serious, intellectually serious Nazi was a man uh, named Carl Schmidt, uh, C-A-R-L, not K, and Schmidt, C-H-S-C-H-M-I-T-T who wrote a book called The Concept of the Political, uh, de attacking democracy, liberal order, and saying what really politics is about is us versus them. Uh, that, uh, I mean, this was taken up by uh, Goebbels with his famous quote, was verbrauchen eines Feindesbild zu schaffen, what must we do? We must build the picture of the enemy. Um, and it, I think, is paralleled by groups such as Nashi, us, ours. And then you have them, the enemy, the homosexuals, the Estonians, the Ukrainians. Uh, and interestingly enough, the, uh, the main impresario of the long-dead Carl Schmidt uh, in Russia today is Alexander Dugin, uh, who is, uh, if you know anything about Russia today, is one of the leading exponents of of this kind of idea of the great, of great Russia. Um, also, as an interesting sidelight, I would say that the first article ever written by uh, Leo Strauss uh, of the Chicago neoconservatives was an article he wrote in German criticizing uh, and tearing, taking apart Carl Schmidt. Uh, and shortly thereafter, he felt too uncomfortable to live in Germany and move to the United States. Um, but that's a sidelight. The point is that this, what we are seeing is an alternative model to liberal democracy. No more attempts to say, we are part of Europe, we are part of the European tradition. Um, uh, of course, what that leaves is not very pretty, as Julia Joffe wrote the other day. If you take, if you take, uh, if you take out Tchaikovsky from Russian culture because he's European, what's le all that's left is a balalaika. Um, but that's, I mean, that's where we're headed. Now, I think we've seen this before. Um, I mean, I actually had this awful premonition 20 years ago when we saw Milosevic building up his whole sort of ersatz philosophy um, on Tsar Nicholas I's uh, idea of orthodoxy, autocracy, and then Derjava. Of course, you, great nationhood is hard to do if you're a population of seven million in Serbia. On the other hand, I mean, Nicholas I's whole sort of orthodoxy, autocracy, and Derjava idea today is exhibited by those horrible pictures where you saw orthodox priests in Crimea blessing tanks and machine guns with which to attack the Ukrainians. I mean, that is really where, what we have ended up with. Milosevic was doing that, he was stopped. It was very tough to stop him, but now we see the same approach being taken. In order for any of that to work, now to bring it back to media and all that stuff, is that um, I, I recommend in addition to reading Peter Pomerantsev's article in Atlantic, is to find, if you can, the YouTube video of uh, 
the biker show in Sevastopol that took place three weeks ago, which was the ultimate, I would say, Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk involving thousands of bikers on Harley Davidson, Bolshoi ballet dancers uh, dancing in a swastika form, uh, tanks with Ukrainian flags on it and later replaced by, uh, by um, <clears throat> Donetsk Republic flags, um, involving rap songs in sort of inciting hatred, involving rock and roll bands, um, if you look at this, it takes an hour. I mean, it is the most, it is the ultimate in Wagner. And it is all leading to one thing, which is that it doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is the great Russian state that will overcome by its spiritual force and its armed force. Um, and then to get to the point of the internet, since one of my main activities actually has to do with uh, defending internet freedom, um, if you look how the information wars are being, are being carried out in, uh, in real live form, I think there's a piece in The Guardian about 20,000 trolls from Russia a day. Anytime anyone writes something that is critical of Russia, you will be massively attacked in the press. I mean, we see this in other newspapers as well, uh, usually written in Google English, but sometimes better English. Google Translate English, that is. Um, you see the, the movement of legislation towards restriction of access to the internet, uh, more in the direction we've seen in countries further east. Um, restrictions on bloggers, you have to register if you're more than 3,000 people, I mean, you have a readership of more than 3,000. So there is this conscious attack to actually restrict access to alternative information, which makes the whole the creation of the enemy even easier to do, but since, if you, I mean, the, the internet is not a solution here. Most of the media is consumed act, in Russia is actually television, not the internet. Uh, so, I mean, I think what we're doing is uh, we're seeing the creation of a mass hysteria that I first read about when I was 15 years old and I read William Shire's The Rise and Fall of, of Nazi Germany, or the Third Reich, to be precise. But, and I remember reading it, say, how could people get so crazy to do what they did? And now, uh, 45 years later, I'm seeing it before me happening, and unfortunately it's right on my border. Uh, so I think, uh, and we will be, and have, have no doubt, it's not simply isolating, right? What is going on right now in the UN, in the ITU is a concerted action on the part of authoritarian countries to actually make the internet uh, governed uh, by an intergovernmental body, the ITU. Up till now, it was, despite all the criticism of the United States, you know, running ICANN, uh, which distributes all of the, the in internet addresses, the DNS numbers, that this, I fear, if that is taken away from the multi-stakeholder model, including civil society, and moves to strictly internet, intergovernmental approaches, uh, we're going to, it's going to be worse than just uh, the internet being controlled in Russia or China or some other country. It will be restrict, there will be internet restrictions on liberal democratic countries. With that depressing okay. note, thank you. Yeah, President, wow, it's sort of hard to have the will to carry on now. Um, I'm going to hope that Jimmy can cheer us up a little bit. Jimmy Wales, who is the founder of Wikipedia, a true revolutionary. Um, and I'd like to hear, Jimmy, whatever you'd like to say, but specifically your response to what Yevgenia said about the rise and fall of the Internet, and the Internet isn't actually as effective, and maybe also some comments on what President Ilves has talked about with Internet freedom. So, please. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, great. Um, well, this is a, it's a very complicated topic, and I think any simple statement um, uh, will miss the nuance of what's really going on online. Uh, one of the things I would definitely react against is the, the idea that, uh, you know, we can't leave something as important as the news to the general public. It has to come from um, authorities. We, we can see 
exactly the weakness in that model in Russia today, uh, that the media is very heavily controlled and influenced by the government. Um, there are good journalists working within Russia who are silenced uh, by their organizations. Um, and the only hope for an independent media in Russia today has to come from grassroots media, has to come from Wikipedia, has to come from bloggers who are blogging uh, on platforms that are not within uh, Russia. Um, and so there is still this fantastic medium out there and this fantastic dialogue that goes on um, despite the top-down propaganda. Now, the thing that is disheartening uh, is that that top-down propaganda um, appears to be more effective than we had hoped it would be. Uh, we have always known that uh, mass media propaganda is effective. We saw, well, we had a whole century of that. Um, and the hope has been that with the development of participatory media, uh, the ability for citizens to question, to dialogue directly with each other, that that chokehold on the flow of information, uh, that ability to distort the truth would be broken. I don't think it's broken. Uh, we see that clearly today. But I still do think that it is dramatically weakened uh, and that there are huge opportunities uh, for people to uh, communicate with each other, uh, to engage in dialogue and so forth. So one of the things uh, that uh, we're doing um, is uh, we're working, I'm encouraging the Ukrainian Wikipedia community uh, to meet with uh, online but also in physical space uh, with the Russian language Wikipedia community. Uh, for both of them to come together. Because clearly, uh, these two communities, uh, if, you, if you know them like I know them, they, they care more about Wikipedia than they do about any particular political situation. But at the same time, they're also products of the place where they live, and they're products of the media that they consume. Uh, and therefore, they do need to have a serious dialogue about making sure that Wikipedia, anyway, is at least one avenue for alternative ideas to spread. And that's, that's quite crucial. Um, in, in uh, regard to what the, the president has said, um, I, I agree completely. I'm very concerned about internet governance issues. Um, I think one of the uh, great uh, costs to the world of the, uh, the entire, all of the revelations about what the NSA has been up to, uh, all of the re revelations about what the US government in general has been up to on online, is that it has really devastated the trust that people would have People might have said um, a few years ago, well, I'm, maybe I'm not that happy that the U.S. has such a key role in internet infrastructure, but at least the U.S. has a strong tradition of press freedom and privacy, and, and you know, it's a, it's a legitimate uh, thing. And now that's completely evaporated. And so when people talk about an intergovernmental solution, you talk about the ITU managing the internet infrastructure, it starts to sound appealing. Um, until you realize, wow, really, like if you talk to the people there, you, you realize actually these are not the people we want having any authority over the fundamental infrastructure of the internet. There are lots of things that can be broken, uh, lots of things that a lot of people want to be broken, uh, so that we don't have this global uniform platform that does allow, at least for the possibility, of ideas to spread outside of borders um, and so forth. So um, I think it's, it's something that people should be more concerned about. Uh, but unfortunately, it's quite a technical topic. Uh, you start talking about ICANN and ITU and uh, blah, 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 blah. It's also boring. Uh, but infrastructure is always boring, and it's always important. And so I think it's worth devoting the time to learn about it and to take care to understand uh, what's going on there. Um, outside of that, um, I don't know. Okay, yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for that, Jimmy. And it's really interesting also to hear about this concrete effort that you're making to bring together these two Ukrainian and Russian internet communities. That's great. Um, our concluding voice, and then I hope we'll have a little bit of time for discussion, um, is Mustafa Nayem. Mustafa is a journalist. He is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Romadske Telebachenia, a new rising Ukrainian television channel. Um, and I was thinking of Mustafa as Yevgenia was speaking, because Mustafa, if you want to find one person who is the person who started the Maidan, who started everything that has happened, it's probably Mustafa. Uh, he posted on his Facebook page, uh, he was so enraged by the about face 
by President Yanukovych on the association agreement that he put a post on his Facebook page and said, let's come out and demonstrate. And the rest is history. So Mustafa really is an example of how the internet, new technologies have transformed the politics of one country. And I would like to hear from Mustafa his perspective on all of this. Thank Proshim. you very much. First of all, journalists in Russia who are supporting not us but profession now, the stand. I will continue in English. I will be speaking the way I can. Uh, internet and about Facebook and revolutions. You know, two years before our revolution, I were in Moscow during Bolotne. And I was so excited that a lot of people, they gathered and communicated and they did it. And I was sad that at the same time in Kyiv, we had Yanukovych, we have jailed politicians. And I thought that, okay, maybe the first step will do Russia, not Ukraine. I was very sad. But now we know the consequence of Bolotne, and we know what we had here in Kyiv. So I think that internet, we are really overestimate the possibility of internet. But it's not that overestimating internet, it's just only tool. It's only tool of communication. If society is not ready, you can provide them with everything and they will not do that. So I think it's a problem of our societies because we had Facebook during 2010, 2011, 12 and 13. And all those years we had jailed politicians, we had the same system, and we, but we didn't have a revolution. And only one signal for our people who were sitting on the internet, it was the, really uh, this agreement of association with the European Union. This was the symbol of change. I'm not really sure that all people who were stayed on Maidan, they knew what is this agreement. But for them, this is the symbol of change. That was very important, not Facebook and not me, not our communication. So about disinformation, about propaganda. You know, the thing is that we have discussion here in Kyiv, but what I really think that we have to have this discussion, not in Kyiv, but not even in Moscow, but in Brussels, in Washington. Because, you know, the victim of this propaganda not, are not Ukrainians. We know everything about country. We know what's going on in the east of our country. We know what, what we had on Maidan. But you, I mean, citizens of, citizen of United States and European countries, you asking us, do we have really fascists on Maidan? You asking us, do we really killing our people on the east of our country? And that's your problem. And it looks like Russia uses the tools of democ democracy against democracy. Come on, you can go to the United States or to Europe and switch TV. In each hotel you will find Russia today. But you will not find BBC and CNN in each hotel. Because they have money and they are using these tools against the United States and against de democracy. That's true. Other thing, it's not secret that a lot of NGOs in the United States and Europe, they're funding by Russian government. That's true. You have in your countries. And you are now wondering what's going on here in Ukraine. We have war, we had revolution, but during all those days, we didn't have questions what we are doing and for what. You have questions why we are doing that. You asking me, for example, it is really true that you wanted to break down Yanukovych. No, we, we wanted to change life. You have question, is it true that private sector, I mean right sector or Svoboda or some fascists are in our government? It's not true, we don't have them. So I think that it is very good for you, those who will come to your country, to help the same discussions in your countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, great English. What can I say? Um, okay, so I'm going to 
It's such a great conversation. I'm conscious that we don't have much time. We started late, but we have another important panel coming. I think maybe I'll just suggest that we have sort of a blitz round across the panel. Please make your comments really short. And ideally, I would love to hear some discussion. So if you can respond to sort of the most interesting thing you've heard, maybe even disagree, possibly. Gideon, you want to try? Well, it's, it's certainly, I don't know whether it's disagreement, but, but uh, question slightly what Mustafa says. I mean, I can understand why you're infuriated by Russia today and so on. I actually don't think it's hugely influential in the West. It may be on every TV channel and so on. I, I've never come across anybody who's an avid watcher of Russia today. Uh, and similarly, there are no doubt all these trolls who put their comments beneath my articles and the article of anyone else. And yeah, they, they create some sort of confusion in the picture. But you know, in the end, they're not the ones with the columns in the newspapers and so on. And they're on marginal television channels. It's, it's irritating, but it's part of, um, I mean, I, I think the bigger picture is, is really that there's a kind of discontent within Western societies and a discontent outside the West, the kind of thing I was talking about, about a US dominated world, which this kind of thing can play into. So people who want an alternative narrative can kind of somehow pick up on some of these things, but I wouldn't overestimate the extent to which it's just the genius of Russian propaganda. Um, one other thought, and then I'll hand on. I mean, I was, I was struck by listening to Yevgenia about the kind of frightening picture you painted of this uh, mind control within Russia by the mass media and so on. But it struck me there was a contrast with uh, the Soviet days when, of course, there was also massive control of the media, even tighter, I think. And yet, also a lot of public skepticism about what they were being told in Pravda or on television. And why is, why is that different now? And I thought maybe it's because in the old days, people could see that their, what they saw around them didn't match what they were watching on television. So there was cynicism about what they were being told. Now it seems to me, what they're being, they don't see what's going on in the Ukraine, so they don't have a reality check. They, they're just kind of told by Russian television or whatever that this, this is what's going on, but they, they don't have a reality to contrast it with. And maybe that, gives a little grounds for hope because to the extent that Russian troops get involved in fighting in Eastern Ukraine and there are casualties, I think the Russian public are already beginning to realize from what I read that actually they are being lied to, to some extent, that there is a Russian military involvement. And there's actually, according to the opinion polls, I see not that strong support for actual Russian military involvement in Ukraine. So maybe there is a limit to the extent to which the Russian government is able to, to lie about what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, okay. Mustafa wants to answer, and then I'd like to hear Jimmy's. Zara's. I have only one note, is that you said that it's not so, I mean, powerful Russian propaganda, but I want to mention you that not we, but countries and governments and journalists outside Ukraine, they call those people who are staying in the east part of Ukraine as rebels. Our government recognized them as a terrorists. From one side, Obama said that we have some troops, Russian troops, in east of part of Ukraine. From the other side, leaders of other countries call them rebels. That's the influence of Russian propaganda. That's not reality. If you see what is going on there, this is terrorists. Why you recognize Al Qaeda terrorists, but not rebels? But those people who are killing our people, you recognize as a rebels. It's not, you know, and I'm sure why it's what's going on. It's not because Obama were in east of part of Ukraine. He has information also from Russian propaganda. That's the consequence. Jimmy? Uh, I, I mean, I think um, one of the things that's really interesting, one of the major differences from the Soviet era is that um, Anyone who is uh, educated uh, in Russia today, um, and the Russians, you know, they have a good educational system. Lots of Russians speak English or German or whatever. In the Soviet days, in the old, old days, they didn't have any access to outside media, and now they have fairly universal access. They can go and read what's being said at uh, 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 the BBC or CNN or Deutsche Welle or wherever they want to. Um, 
And yet, alarmingly, you still look at the, the polls, and yeah, there may not be uh, that much support for military intervention in the Ukraine, but you see Putin's popularity levels um, astonishingly high. Uh, at a time when you would think that people who have access to a diversity of media would say, um, wow, I can't believe, you know, I mean, I think he's more popular than George W. Bush was. Uh, and in, you know, people were very um, unsure about what Bush was doing and so on and so forth. So that's disturbing. I don't really have an answer to that. That, that is the kind of thing that we would hope, uh, we would have imagined at some point. How did I get to be the pessimistic one on the panel? It's unusual. Um, I, we would have thought, you know, wow, now the Internet's available. A government can't issue propaganda and, and blind their people, turns out they can still, and that's, uh, that's concerning. And I don't have any answers to that, except that I still think, as you said, though, where, where I'll agree with you, is that there are limits to it. There are limits beyond which uh, blatant lies can be told, but as they're exposed, there's no way to hide that they've been exposed over time. Okay, Yevgenia wants to answer. I would love to hear about, are there limits to Putin's propaganda? And also, Gideon has raised some comparisons with the Soviet era. Are Russians less cynical about government propaganda today than they used to be? You know, I think I'm the only one here who lived under Soviets and under Soviet propaganda. You did too? No, you didn't. And I'm living under Putin's propaganda as well. There is the difference, obviously. There is, uh, to be sure, current Russia is not the Soviet Union. Uh-uh. It's yet to, come, to become the Soviet Union. It's very different countries still. We have, plural, you know, we have 40% uh, of the economy is still in private hands. So there is definitely, you know, certain pluralism that comes of, you know, of the fact that, you know, there are different means of ownership and different businesses. But what, you know, I, I would like to respond um, to say just two quick points. One, uh, I don't know whether you heard what happened with the Wik Wikipedia article on uh, JET SU-25. Uh, so to, to those of you who don't know, after MH-17 was taken down, uh, Russian uh, Genstab, um, chief of staff, came up with, with the hypothesis that Malaysian Airline 17 was shot by the Ukrainian uh, military JET SU-25, right? You know. So, or if, you go, if you go on Wikipedia, you will find, whether in English or in Russian, you will find an article on this jet. In the original Wikipedia article in Russian, it was written down that uh, SU-25, SU the, uh, the jet, the military jet, is unable to go uh, to 10,000 uh, meters. It can fly only lower than that. So when it turned out that MH17 was shot or, uh, uh, at 10,000 meters, uh, we assume that some KGB guys edited the, uh, the, uh, the Wikipedia page on SU25 so that it turned out that SU-25 was able to fly on the, uh, on the altitude of 10,000 meters. That's what makes me a little bit sick about Internet, that it is so easy to manipulate. Back in the Soviet times, you know, I wasn't allowed to go abroad, to, live, uh, to go outside the Soviet Union all the way to 1990. I was not allowed to go. But back in the Soviet times, you know, the, some, you know, there was obviously search for truth, and there was search for knowledge. And this truth and knowledge was coming out of the books, of the very good research and studies and books. It was Orwell, you know, I mean, it was good, uh, good, books, good knowledge, learning, etc. Now, when people are looking for the alternative to propaganda, they go on the web, they go on the internet, and they face the environment of 
unchecked facts of hell of a lot of speculation that has nothing to do with the reality. People don't want to bear costs to check facts. Yeah, I will, I will. They go, they read, and they more or less assume that it is true. Okay. That's my biggest concern with the environment of internet. That's, that's the environment of, you know, mediocres who are pouring out unchecked information and people are swallowing all this bullshit, you know, without putting their time and an energy and ability to check those facts. Okay, Yevgenia, I feel like I'm back in the classic old media, new media wars, not talking about Ukraine and Russia. Jimmy, I really want to hear your response to Yevgenia's point, but can I ask you to just pause for one minute? Because we'd like to get a quick comment from Sean Walker about all of this. Of um, The Guardian, whose reports, we're, we're all reading your reports, so thank you very much. Um, well, I just wanted, maybe you, the, the sort of topic was about information and disinformation. And there's been a lot of talk about the Russian side of that. And clearly the level of Russian propaganda and the way Russia's day works and the statements coming out of the foreign ministry are horribly cynical and often bear absolutely no relation to the truth. Um, but I w wouldn't mind just also mentioning that it would seem to me that the response to that from Ukraine uh, should be uh, an attempt to not to copy it. And I think there has been a little sense of that uh, in recent weeks. Uh, I've just come back from three weeks in the East. You know, the number of times we set out looking for something because the Ukrainian National Security Council had said that something had happened. We get there, it's nothing of the sort. Um, Yevgenia mentioned MH17. There were ridiculous things coming out of the Russian general staff. But also the head of the SBU said publicly that Ukraine believed that the Russians were trying to shoot down an Aeroflot plane full of Russians as a false flag operation to blame the Ukrainians. I haven't seen any evidence of that. They didn't provide any evidence of that. But we, we seem to be into this period now where both sides are putting out ludicrous things. Uh, the Russians are better at it. They're more cynical and it's more pervasive. But I think the response should be, um, the, res the response shouldn't be to fall into that same trap. Uh, and just finally, uh, the other thing, you know, we were talking about social media and Twitter. And I think that the advantages are obvious that if, you know, if there was a massacre or something terrible happening, 20 years ago, it, it might take you three or four days to find it, to write about it. Now, someone will have put a video up on YouTube in, in an hour. Um, but it can also be quite dangerous. It can also put people, you know, videos don't always tell the whole story. You have to go to the place, you have to find out what's happened. The number of times that there are still people talking about incidents that happened uh, in the East. People are absolutely certain that it happened one way because they watched one video that told them that. Uh, and then there seems to be a, people seem to have this ability to, to selectively read uh, Twitter to, to only sort of pick out the things that support their point of view. So I think, you know, all of that stuff is really important, but it should augment real journalism and real international organizations going and looking at things, and it shouldn't be a substitute for it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, you can, but hang on. So this was such an interesting panel that we were given an extra 15 minutes, of which only three minutes are left. So I'm going to give everybody, literally, there are five of you guys, like less than a minute each, final comments. Jimmy, you go first, then Yevgeny, okay? And then yeah. we'll go through the so, rest. So this incident of, of uh, a, a Russian government IP address editing the entry on SU-25 to change its capabilities is one of the fantastic triumphs of the Wikipedia model. This attempt at propaganda was caught very quickly, exposed, made public, and embarrassed them very badly, and is a fantastic uh, example of the kind of scrutiny that you can get from the public. If that same information were published on Russia Today, it would still be there today. There's no possibility of response or change. There's no open public dialogue. And so for me, this kind of thing shows the limits of trying to uh, issue propaganda when reasonable, rational people. I mean, the, the people who write the Wikipedia entries about military hardware 
are military hardware buffs and historians, and they just love, I don't know, they're, they're a bunch of geeks who like jet planes and things like that. They know immediately. You make a change like that, and they're like, well, that's stupid. That's completely wrong. We know all about this jet. We've been writing about it for years. So uh, it is one of the strengths of the model. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Evgenia. Quickly. Uh, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to... Uh, Mustafa, we're friends. We know each other, you know, for quite a while. But, you know, um, I think, you know, I was a little bit, you know, I'm concerned when you said that, you know, people who are in the east of Ukraine, you know, they're terrorists. There are terrorists, and there are bandits, and there are gangsters. That's true. But there are people of different sort as well. You know, that's what, you know, my reporters who work in Donetsk and who work in Lugansk, they spoke just to quite a few people, you know, who are idealists. You know, you may agree or disagree with them, but they are not terrorists. Uh, just recently, Keith Gasson uh, ran a very interesting piece in the London Review of Book, and Keith is a very good reporter, you know, about these other people who do exist in the East Ukraine as well. And I think it's important, I think, for Ukrainian public, for your own sake, to know that that's not just about Strelkov Girkin, you know, that there are very different people in Donbass you know, who are very dissatisfied with the station, who are really afraid that they're going to be deprived from the right to speak Russian, that, you know, they, they're eager to work and to fight for, the, uh, for their right to build a more just society in the East the way they see it. It just, I think it's important that you, that for Ukrainian journalists, not to miss this part of the story as well. I am reading Ukrainian Pravda each morning. I am watching Gramatsky TV, you know. It's not that I don't follow the Ukrainian news, but I'm afraid that sometimes you miss the story and it's important because if you're going to keep this as one country, if West and East and Central Ukraine is going to uh, go as one country. You in bad need here in Kiev to understand why so many people in Donbass, why they raise up, why they are ready to fight okay. and die. I would respond to that by saying because they believe what they see on manufactured television. Uh, if you see actresses appearing in different towns, the same actress being playing one role in one town and then another town is the same person. When you see, when you see fabricated news stories about well, filmed with actresses, then it's no surprise that in fact people fear things that will not happen to them, but fear that they will. And so, uh, at that, that's one of the effects of this kind of propaganda. Fear among people is real. The point is that they have been watching things that are not real. And if that happens, unless I see the great reporter from, from uh, Vice Television here, who is one of the few people whose videos I always watch, uh, that actually documents what's going on. It's in stark contrast to to the kinds of stuff I see on Russian television, and I think Vice News is probably one of the heroes of this entire thing here. But uh, the point is, if you, you, if you manufacture a televised reality, as in the movie uh, the Wagging the Dog, uh, a fake war, which just to get a politician elected, I mean, we're seeing now this bizarre thing where a funny movie has turned into a horrible reality. Where we, see, uh, where we see a war being manufactured through, through, the, through the media. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that, there's a secondary layer that I think feeds into all of this, which is at the level of, I mean, at the conceptual level. Suddenly, we have this term as a real objectified term known as Novorossiya. Novorossiya does not exist. It ne has never existed. It was a 19th century kind of a... And now it is, being, it is being written into history books as this old, age-old thing that 
we are now rightfully restoring. So the problem is that the conceptual level we're creating new, uh, I mean, starting with fake facts on the ground, we're creating new concepts, new conspiratorial theories, and it seems to work. And uh, I can see this in my own country where people are genuine, I mean, people who are, rely more on the Russian media are fearful uh, of, based on things that aren't happening. I mean, and you can see that spreading across, I would say, the entire Russosphere, if you believe in such a term. Okay, thank you very much, President. And I'm getting, do you mind, we're running over. I was going to give Mustafa, as our Ukrainian, the last word. Okay, Mustafa. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say the Bob comment about our agencies, SBU and uh, RNBO. You know, we are not happy with our agencies as a journalist. But what is true that we are not agencies, journalists in Ukraine. So they may be, they are copying something, but not Ukrainian journalists. So it's not propaganda. This is war. They are fighting they can, what, the way they can do, but not Ukrainian journalists. We are saying that they are lying when they are, when they are lying. You can see that even in the United States. It's not secret that United States, they are lying, but journalists not always can say that. I'm not talking about Russia. About what said Evgenia, you're right. I, I have been to Donetsk just two days ago. And I'm really what I'm asking as a citizen, not even as a journalist. Why we are asking to recognize them as a terrorist? Not because we really believe that they are terrorists, but you should see difference between DNR, I mean Donetsk People's Republic, and those citizens who live in Donetsk. There are difference, and they are using this system of coordinates, saying that they are some organizations. They are not organizations. This is the same difference between member of Al-Qaeda and citizen of Afghanistan. This is difference. But you should recognize DNR as terrorists, as we did, just because that allow us to say that things that doing Russia, for example, like providing them with arm and food, it's not legal because there's cooperation with terrorist organization. But United States can't say that because they don't recognize them as a terrorist. From the other side, on Facebook, this is a very good example, you can see a lot of DNR representatives, I mean, accounts. And officially, Facebook administration, they can't ban them because they are not recognized as a terrorist. So that's the question. And I believe, and I'm sure, that there are a lot of people who really are not happy with Kyiv state. And I have a lot of questions to our government, why they started to share this cake of power after Maidan, instead of inviting all peoples from all districts to the Kyiv and saying that, that it's, not, it's not our victory, it's our common victory. That's question. But anyway, we should say what is true. We have deal with D DNR as a terrorist organization. That's true. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's a clear and sharp point on which to conclude. Um, I agree with you, Mustafa. Uh, thank you uh, very much for really a absolutely fascinating panel. And I would like especially to single out Yevgenia, thanking her for participating in it and for her opening comments. Very important to hear. So thank you very much, everyone.